Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, we'll discuss the topic, the overloaded piece. What do I mean by that? Well, what it means is, when a certain piece has a duty of guarding two different pieces, defending them, or defending two important squares, what could it be? It could be, for example, a square when one of your opponent's pieces is about to give checkmate and you need to guard that square while that same piece, for example, is protecting an important piece such as a knight or a rook. Let's see it in practice what I mean exactly. Here we go. In this position, we can see that there is even material on the board. It's always quite important to be aware of the material balance in the position. So in this case we can see that each side has a queen, a bishop, a knight as well as four pawns. What's important to notice in this position is the queen on d5, which I could say is well positioned. The problem is though that it has with one arm protecting the knight on h5 and the other arm is protecting the bishop on b3. And this is exactly what I mean when I'm talking about an overloaded piece. It means that if we manage to pull that hand, one of the hands, in one direction, it will have to get dragged in that direction and we lose whatever was in the other hand. So in this case, if the white bishop captures the black bishop, at the moment winning a bishop, if black does not capture the white bishop on b3, white just stays a bishop ahead, and that's a significant gain. On the other hand, if the queen does recapture, then the queen on d5, that's no longer on d5, is not protecting anymore the knight that's on h5. And therefore, white can simply capture that knight. So we can see the clear gain compared to our starting position when we had even material. While at the ending position, white will be a knight ahead. Let's see a good number of examples on this theme in this lesson. Here is our second example. Here we go. Again, this is a quite basic example and the first thing is to figure out which black piece is overworked. And you can notice that the black rook on e8 is guarding two pieces, the rook on d8 as well as the knight on e4. While, as you can see, in the current position there is complete equality when it material is concerned, each side having two rooks, a knight, and three pawns. The correct continuation here is to pull the hand of the rook in one direction by trading rooks of equal value and then when the black rook recaptures the white rook is safe and free to capture the black knight on e4. Now let's go back to the starting position and discuss about the fact Better could white instead have captured the knight first? And now, if that same rook, the one that was overworked on e8, captures back on e4, then capture the rook. And again, as we can see, white is a knight ahead. So, is this correct as well? Rook takes knight? Well, not quite. Because remember, Always look not only for your own best moves, but also of your opponents. And in this case, black has two choices of capturing a rook. One is the one we saw, but black has a much better way by first capturing the other rook with a check, and that's very important, and that's called an intermediate move. When black doesn't respond to a capture with a recapture, but responds with a different check or capture. 
and only after the white king moves out of the check then the black rook would capture the white rook having substantial material gain. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this endgame there is a more imbalanced position. White has a rook while black doesn't but on the other hand black has a bishop which white doesn't have and also black has an extra knight. So black in reality has a bishop and a knight for white's rook which is on a6. Can you think of the piece that's overworked here for black? There is one black piece that's actually protecting three of his own pieces and two of them are rather important. If you were thinking about the bishop on e5, you were certainly right. That bishop is guarding a knight on g3, a second knight on c3, and less importantly, but it's also guarding the pawn on c7. As we can see, this bishop is overworked. How can white take advantage of this situation? If white would be able to pull the hand of the bishop in a different direction, then it's protecting one of the important pieces. That would work well. And the way to accomplish that in this case is to trade knights, to capture a knight. It's important to realize that if black chooses not to recapture, that would mean that white simply won a knight for nothing. At the same time, if the bishop recaptures indeed on c3, then the bishop left the protection of the knight on g3 and the king could capture back. Now the material balance is on white's favor. White has a rook versus a bishop by both sides having two pawns each. Let's continue with the next example. In this position, the black rook is under attack on h8. What should black do? Should black move the rook away from the attack? Or should black trade rooks? Or something different? It's very important to be aware of your options. Also, typically, the first thing to look at is the forceful moves. The most forceful moves are when you give a check, when you attack your opponent's king, because then the opponent has no choice but to react to that. It usually limits your opponent's choices of moves to a couple of choices at most. Either by moving the king or blocking the check, or in some cases, capturing the piece that is giving the check. So, in this case, if black would choose to simply move the rook away, let's say to e8 or some other place along the 8th rank, it would be certainly playable, but black would not gain anything by doing that. Trading rooks looks pretty good, because it seems that the white king was overworked by protecting the bishop on f3 as well as the rook on h1. And now, if the white king recaptures, everything is great. Bishop takes bishop. Black won the bishop, which is a major gain, giving black a very significant advantage. However, as I keep mentioning it over and over, it's rather important at all times to look out for the best options for your opponent as well, not just for yourself. And the correct move after rook takes rook is to first by force exchange the bishops. By bishop takes bishop check, very importantly, so the black rook does not get the time to move away. And then after king takes bishop, king takes rook, and at least white maintains the material balance. So understanding all of this, that moving the rook away or even trading the rook doesn't lead to material gain. What does? What should black do? Well, 
If it didn't work to pull one hand of the king, let's try pulling the other hand. And as I mentioned before, forceful moves are typically the first to look at. And in this case, it's definitely the correct choice. By capturing the white bishop with a check, white's best choice is to recapture, and then there is nobody protecting the rook in the corner, so black can simply play rook takes rook. And now black is a whole entire rook ahead, which is an easily winning advantage. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this position, it's white's turn. And I think by now you should be able to figure out which black piece is the one that's overworked. That's protecting two pieces. And that piece is the black queen on c6. If you're on the defensive side, try to avoid such situations when one of your pieces needs to protect two pieces because oftentimes it does not end well. In this case, the queen is protecting both rooks on a8 as well as on c4. White has two choices in pulling the queen's hand. One is capturing the rook on c4 and the other one on a8. Well, if you listen carefully to my comments to the previous position, you recognize that the more forceful way is certainly the first one to look at. And if you look at rook takes rook, queen takes rook, you realize that white can safely capture the second rook for free on c4. Quite important to notice that after black's check on a1, white guards the c1 square twice and therefore White can simply block the check with either the rook or the queen and maintain the extra rook that they just gained. On the other hand, it would be a big blunder for white to capture the rook on c4. And the reason for that would be that black by no means would be forced to capture this rook back on c4 and leave the other rook in the corner hanging, but could instead win the game themselves by playing rook a1, and white suffers checkmate because of the back rank problem. Let's see the next example. Here we go. Well, this position is a bit different because in this case, the white queen is not guarding two different pieces. It is guarding the rook that is being pressured by the black queen and the other thing that the white queen is guarding is it's the back rank. Remember in the previous position I mentioned briefly about the back rank problem that white had. Had they chosen the wrong capture, capturing the wrong rook? Well in this case also the white queen actually is busy stopping the black rook from arriving on c1 and giving checkmate to the white king there. If black would come down with the rook to c1 immediately, white would just capture that rook and it's true that the queen would no longer protect the rook on b4, but after the black queen captures that rook, that would only result in a trade. One rook for one rook. So what should black do to still take advantage of the fact that the white queen is busy guarding the rook and guarding the back rank checkmate on c1? Well, this is also known as deflection or removing the guard, but I'm trying to demonstrate a different element really, which of course is co closely connected to the subject of removing a guard. And here the solution is queen capturing the rook, which is quite brilliant. It gives up a queen. Of course, we only do that 
if we either checkmate or gain at least as much material back than what we gave up. And in this case, should white accept the sacrifice, black indeed would move the rook down, check, and white can delay checkmate only by one move, and that is blocking the check, and and arrives anyway. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. Now this is a much more complex example than all the previous ones. Again, the theme is rather similar as in our very last example. When the queen was guarding the rook, like it is here, and it's guarding another key square where the black queen is about to come and checkmate the white king. But at the moment, the white queen is guarding that square. As I mentioned earlier, first look for the most forceful moves. And among those, of course, queen h1 first comes to mind, which is almost a checkmate. But of course, almost in chess doesn't quite count, because in this case, the white queen would be able to block the check and hang on to the game for now. So what could black do in this position to try to pull the hand of that white queen? And in a way, again, it's very closely connected to the theme of removing the guard. And the correct way to do that is in this position, to attack the queen. And sadly for the white queen at this moment, white needs to give up on something. Either the control of the crucial g3 square or the rook. The only way to avoid a checkmate on g3 is to remain on the diagonal somewhere along b8 and h2. However, pretty much anywhere the queen goes to on the diagonal would mean that the queen would no longer guard the rook on c3. Of course, going to e5 would maintain both, but would allow simply queen takes queen, which would be even worse than the other two options. A very brilliant move. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this position, it's Black's turn. And typically, the first thing you need to be aware of in any given position is what are the threats of your opponent? And in this particular case, the threats are quite serious and significant. White is about to checkmate black, in fact, in two different ways, by moving the queen to b7 or to a8. Well, which white piece is overworked in this position? Well, that piece is the bishop on g2. It's guarding the queen on c6 as well as guarding the pawn on h3. While a pawn oftentimes is not that important, but here it's very, very important, and you'll see in a moment why. Again, black would have a choice to first trade queens and then capture the pawn, which is certainly not a bad choice. Black won a pawn. However, Black can do much better. And of course, that reminds me of the famous saying, you see a good move, look around, see if you have an even better one. So in this position, the correct course of action is to switch the move order and rather sacrifice our rook for that pawn. And as I mentioned earlier, the important part is, is not just that little pawn. The important part is that white is almost checkmated, meaning that white has only one single choice, that is to capture the rook. And that means that the queen is unprotected. We pulled away the hand of the bishop to 
gain significant material. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this position, black has major material advantage. Black has a queen, while white only has a rook in return. While each side has a three-point piece, a bishop versus knight. In this case, the black bishop is guarding two key squares. Not protecting any piece, but simply guarding two key squares. Both of them are key squares because if the white knight could go to g3, that would result in a fork attacking both the black king and queen. However, at the moment, the bishop does guard that square. Also, the bishop is guarding another important square, namely the a5 square, where if the rook could appear safely, it would be a skewer. If the black king would need to move, the black queen would be lost. Here, the correct solution is by sacrificing the rook on a5, with the idea that if bishop takes rook, then the knight is ready to fork. Check. King moves out. Knight takes queen. And as we know, king and bishop versus a lone king is not sufficient mating material. This is an automatic draw. What would happen if instead of capturing the rook, black would choose to block the check? Well, that would make things even a lot worse because white would be ready to still play knight g3 using the pin. Remember the lesson we had on the pin? The bishop cannot capture the knight now, because that would leave the black king in check. And as we know, that's illegal. Now the last question we have to answer is, could white instead start the other way around and check with the knight first, give the knight up, and then give the check with the rook in hopes that the black king now would need to move and then rook takes queen would still result in a draw. Well, not quite. Remember, always look out for the best responses also for your opponent. And in this case, the bishop can move back to e5, block the check and keep black's tremendous material advantage. So the only correct choice was giving the rook up first and then making the fork with the knight. And now, here is our last example in this lesson. Here we go in this position. Again, we have complete material balance. But white has a wonderful move here to use the fact that the black queen is overworked. It's guarding the knight on d6 and it's guarding the rook on e8. So if we can pull the hand in one direction, black will end up losing something. And that correct solution is queen capturing the knight on d6. Now, if the queen captures the queen, simply rook e8. While this is not a checkmate, black can block the check. It's not hard to get convinced that white won a piece. White has a knight. Why black doesn't? Would also rook takes rook do the job? And now, if queen takes rook, then queen takes knight? No, not quite, because black has another option as well, a much better move, namely, knight takes rook. And now, black is home safe without losing any material. So the move order of these things in which direction to pull the defender of the two different pieces or, or important squares, oftentimes it's rather important. Well, I hope I gave you some more ideas on how to gain advantage in your games. Try to think about these ideas when you play. Thank you for listening and so long until next week.